righty then. This advertisement. Come on. Okay, guys. We're in the saddle. Good to see all <clears throat> the familiar, I was going to say faces, but names. And it's a pleasure and an honor that our brother, Andrew Martin, is joining us. My favorite atheist. And I call him brother because I prophesied, right? I'm not a prophet, but I'm prophesying. This man will eventually come back more in love with Jesus than ever before. Because you can see he's hungry for Jesus. And I thank the Lord Jesus for putting favor in my heart. In his heart, I should say, not my heart. Favor, yes. Uh, let me take that back. I thank the Lord Jesus for putting favor in my heart towards him because I love this man. And I thank the Lord Jesus for putting favor in his heart towards me to put up with my imperfections and my issues, right? But I love the rest of you, all my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I love you. If I don't mention you by name, don't think that I don't <clears throat> see you and acknowledge your support. I love you guys. You know, we have our dear brother, Protestant believer in first last. They're admins who helped me, who have been a blessing to my life. So pray for them. Protestant believer in first last. Pray the Lord Jesus bless them, provide for them, seal them, preserve them for his glory. I couldn't do the stuff I do without the support of such brothers as well as sisters. Right. For the sake of Jesus, they put up with me and tolerate me. And I thank the Lord for that. Right. I was listening to the session yesterday. Right. And I got to be honest with you guys. I cannot stand my voice. <laughs> Honestly, I really, I really thank Jesus and I'm appreciative of his grace that at least you guys, because of the grace of Jesus, can tolerate the sound of my voice. I think I have one of the worst voices for speaking. And I mean that. I don't know how you guys do it. But thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and favor that you make even the sound of my voice pleasing to their ears. I don't know how you do it. It's got to be grace, man. You're proved that it's the grace of the Lord, right? You have a speaker. So thank you, Lopez. God bless you. Uh, Lopez Media Ministries International. He's also a good friend of Idiotai Apologetics, the brother who's hosting me. Pray for these men. Pray the Lord Jesus bless their families and preserve them so they can grow in the love of Christ, right? It's hard listening to you, but it's worth it. Hey, Zena, I like that, sister. You know you, you're Chaldean Assyrian when you got to take shots back at the man. You know what I'm saying? The Syrian woman, the Chaldean woman, they're more bold and feisty than us men. They'll go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They'll even give Mike Tyson a run for his money. And the only running Mike Tyson will do is running for cover and safety, you know? So we'll wait a few more minutes, trusting the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the Word of God and to anoint me to speak truth without error and speak it passionately for the glory of Jesus Christ. Bruce Lee would annihilate, annihilate. In an all-out fight, he would annihilate Tyson and everyone else with no rules. Because Bruce Lee's speed was blinding, and he hit like a heavyweight, and he knew how to finger jab. <clears throat> so Tyson, he'd have to learn how to fight Bruce Lee on the Braille system. <laughs> we were sailing along on a moonlight bay. By the way, overall, for those of you who listened to yesterday's session, how many of you were blessed, challenged right, by the session? And how many of you actually enjoyed the fact that Hater Wood joined in, chimed in to advertise Muhammad's Boom Boom Room? And how many of you liked the fact that Michael Jackson prophesied my coming and my Michael Jackson impersonation? Who would have thunk it? Michael Jackson, a greater prophet than Muhammad. Now when you hear that song, you won't hear it the same way. Shamon, Shamon, right? That's me. He was praying that God would send me. Shamon, that's me, Sam Shamon, right? I'm telling you, Shamon, eh, eh. and that's why he then sang in anticipation that the Lord Jesus would send me, that when Shamon comes, heal the world, make it a better place. Anyway, I'm, I'll make sure to find the day job so I don't give it up. Right? Does Zena just take a, did that Assyrian Chaldean take another shot on me? Shamon walk? Shamoon, shamoon, ba -da 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 -da. Before I begin the session, we're going to talk about Satan as a, as a seraph, cherub, possibly. No, I didn't. Before I do that, I do want to address something. People often say, and I want everyone to listen to this because I want to correct this misapplication of Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. And thank Brother, brother Protestant for posting verses. You don't need to post this right now, but I will have you post something. 
and I want to deal with the misapplication, the misuse, the misapplication, the misuse of this passage. And by the way, Andrew Martin, I'm pretty certain you listened to my series on Satan, Lucifer, and the cher cherubim, and Satan taking a third of the angels. Overall, what was your impression? You know, because it is a joy that God would use me to serve you. Really, it is. You're a blessing to my heart. I just want you to know that when I see you, I enjoy you because you're not one of these militant atheists who come and mock and blaspheme God. All right. I appreciate that. Oops. We're buffering here. Sorry. We're buffering. Let me go to 360. But it should be. I am 360. It's okay. The quality is good. Yearning truth. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, man. All right. Good. Okay, here, let me correct the misapplication of Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Let me correct this. Guys, please, I need your attention. Trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me for the glory of Jesus and protect me from error and loosening my tongue and enabling me for the glory of Jesus Christ to recall, right, recall passages and interpret them correctly. Yeah. All right, Andrew, well, go back and listen to them over and over again until it makes sense. Sorry for the distraction. Someone asked me that. Why do I not just do a session, right, instead of doing a live session, just do a pre-recorded session and then come in and take questions? Well, one of the reasons why I do live sessions and one of the reason, reasons why I pay attention to the chat, let me explain that so everyone understands. I've been teaching the Bible since, I believe, 2000, the year 2000 having live Bible studies in local churches and places, and as well as in Paltak at that time. And one thing, a habit that I developed was engaging the crowd, engaging the crowd to make sure I'm not losing them. That's why I repeat myself at least twice or three times, because I know I speak fast, but I want to make sure by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm speaking clearly and the people are getting it. That's why I say, did you get it? Anyone confused? Because I do have a concern that I don't lose the flock, that the Spirit will use me to help educate the flock and take them to a higher level for the glory of Christ. So that's why I watch your comments. That's why I like the live sessions, live chat, because I want to engage you. I want to make sure you're following along. Now, there are two problems with that. Number one, we have short attention spans because we, we live in fast food you know, society. We want even theology to be fast food, five minutes, 10 minutes or less, or we lose focus. So that becomes a distraction because when I bring a point, the person is not so much focusing on the point. His mind wanders off onto other issues that is important to him or her, but not related to the point I'm trying to make. So then they get lost. And then when they ask a question, they lose me and I get frustrated because of my imperfection. But then secondly, you have the trolls who are agents of Satan, who are not here to learn, here to attack and distract and use of Satan to cause division. So those are the two setbacks, right? You, you with me there? Those are the two setbacks uh, with doing live streams and engaging people in the comment section in the live chat. But again, I prefer this because I want to make sure I'm seeing your reactions I'm engaging you and receiving feedback, letting me know whether you understand it by the power of the Holy Spirit and not understand it, but if you're being blown away with the depth and beauty of the scriptures that the Spirit has produced, because my goal is that the Holy Spirit would be pleased to use me by his power to see Christians who love Jesus fall more in love with Jesus, be more in awe of Jesus and more in awe of the Bible, having no doubt this is God's word and that God is real. And Christ is risen, as well as to be used of the Spirit to bring others to this Jesus who loves them and adores them more than they can understand, as the Lord loosens my tongue, right? So that's why I do it. So just wanted to... Now, Walter, are you attacking me? I don't know, man. You come off and say, are you a little OCD? So I don't know. that Maybe you really want to know or you're attacking me, which is... Be honest, Walter. Be honest. Since we're talking about snakes and serpents... I wonder if you're one of them in disguise. How about that? Do you really want to know if I'm OCD? Okay. So you're not attacking me, right, Walter? All right. I, I don't know if I'm OCD. I may be OCD. I may be ADD. I don't know. But one thing I do love is OCB. 
old country buffet. So even though I may not be OCD, I am one of OCB's biggest supporters. OCB, old country buffet. For those of you in the West, that's hometown buffet. All right. And by the way, yearning truth, we don't do LMAO. We do LMBO because LMAO means laughing my aspirations off. Let's keep it G-rated and do LMBO, laughing my butt off. I, right? Okay. Okay. So now with that said, let me deal with one passage that's misapplied, and then we're going to go into our topic. Oftentimes, people will tell me, well, why didn't you go and confront a particular brother in private? And they'll cite Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. They'll say, you should have approached him in private and confronted him before you went public. Now, let me tell you why that's a misapplication of that passage. Are you ready to hear? Because I know you're here to listen to God speaking through imperfect vessels for his glory. You're not here for me. As good looking as I am, you're not here for me. Let me tell you why that's a misapplication of Matthew 18, 15 to 17. You ready? You want to hear why that's a misapplication? Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17 is talking about a brother sinning against you privately, a sin between you and him. So if he sinned against you, it's something between you and him, you confront him privately. And then if he doesn't repent, you confront him before two witnesses, and then you bring him before the church. The Bible, when it comes to someone sinning publicly and affecting the flock publicly, then you must confront that person publicly for the benefit of others. So you must make a distinction between a sin that's between you and a brother, and you confront him privately, and a sin that's not necessarily directed against you, but it's a public sin that's now going to affect the spiritual well-being of the flock of Christ, specifically those who are babes and immature in their faith. That's why in Galatians 2, verses 11 to 16, Galatians 2, verses 11 to 16, Paul did not confront Peter privately, but confronted him and you rebuked him and shamed him publicly because Peter's sin was in the public limelight in full view of the public. And so he had to correct them publicly in order to protect the flock from being misled by Peter's compromise and hypocritical attitude. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 16. You with me there? Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 16. Just want to make sure you understand the difference between a brother sinning against you and you confront him privately and a sin that's public that will affect the spiritual well-being of believers, especially those who are weak in their faith and conscience. Here, let's read it. First and last posted it. Let's read it. But when Peter was come to Antioch, which is in Syria, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now watch. He publicly rebukes him, and I'll explain why. For before that, certain came from James. Before certain Jews came from James, the Lord's brother in Jerusalem, so before these Jews came from Jerusalem to Antioch, Syria, Peter would eat with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He was afraid that these Jews, circumcision means physical Jews, would condemn Peter for eating with Gentiles, knowing that the Gentile practices make a Jew ceremonially unclean because they can eat anything and everything, right? And the other Jews dissembled. So when they saw Peter pulling away, Jewish Christians dissembled, pulled away as well with him. Now watch what Peter sa Paul says in verse 13. Insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away. Notice how strong the language is with their dissimulation. Dissimulation, basically, if you look at it, means hypocrisy. So that even Barnabas, my companion, was misled, led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, before them all, I rebuked them publicly. Wait, 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 Paul. Shame on you, Paul. You should have confronted him privately. You should have took Peter aside and spoke to him privately. How dare you confront him publicly and shame him publicly? Right? If thou being a Jew, livest after the man of Gentile, even though you're a Jew, you act like a Gentile, you eat like a Gentile, and not as the Jews do, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? See, he's calling him out for his hypocrisy. You catch it? 
We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, right? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even if we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Did you catch what he did? He condemned him publicly. Now, notice what Peter's sin, what, what the nature of Peter's sin was, as the Holy Spirit just anoints my mouth to speak clearly. Peter did not impose the dietary restrictions or circumcision upon the Gentile believers, as did these Jewish so-called Christians that came from Jerusalem. His guilt was that when these so-called Jewish Christians came down from Jerusalem, who were teaching Gentiles, it's not enough to believe in Christ for salvation. You got to get circumcised and keep the dietary laws and other aspects of the law of Moses in order to be justified. Paul opposed them, condemned them for being false brothers, preaching a false gospel. Peter didn't teach that, but then he pulled away and sat with them. And in sitting with them, he gave them credibility in the eyes of others. After all, if you are a Gentile believer, and you know Peter is an eyewitness to Jesus Christ, commissioned by Jesus Christ, and he sits with these Jews who are preaching a false gospel, you're going to think, well, they can't be that bad, because after all, Peter wouldn't associate with them. The fact that he's sitting with them, associating with them, means they must be true brothers. So in doing that, Peter is now giving them a credibility, giving credence to their false gospel, in which now they can mislead others saying, hey, we're kosher because Peter himself sits with us and approves of us, so we're not false brethren like Paul teaches. Do you see why now he condemned him pub publicly? Do you see why he had to shame him publicly and embarrass him publicly? Because his sin was public and he was given credibility to false Christians by even sitting and eating with them. You with me there? Zena got it. Now you see why I went after David Lynn publicly. Because that's David Lynn's sin to his shame and humiliation. By giving Marcus Rogers a platform and inviting him to his conference... Those who are weak and don't know better and trust this man to have discernment, which he has none. May the Lord rebuke and chasten him to repent, if he's truly a brother. By doing that, he now gives credibility to Marcus Rogers and now gives him a platform to his followers so that Marcus Rogers could deceive them. Marcus Rogers is a oneness heretic who wants to find his way into Trinitarian churches to get the Trinitarians to support him and join him. And give him the right hand of fellowship. Yes, just a search. Marcus Rogers' oneness theology. So, Zena, you got it, right? I actually challenged him. I did. If you go on his Facebook, I said, I'll come to your church at my own expense. And we're going to record it and have it live. And I'll answer all your silly, stupid, satanic questions that you're asking to mislead people in order to open their hearts to oneness theology. He refused. He goes, I wouldn't invite you because supposedly I'm harsh. And that's when he said, Marcus Rogers is so much nicer than you. I'm sure Satan can be nicer than me too when he masquerades as an angel of light. What does that prove exactly? He probably deleted them, Zena. I don't know. Yep, he is. So I don't know. He probably deleted them. Now, now that I've explained Matthew 18, 15 to 17, its application, please do not contact me again. Daily light. I, I guess everything I said fell on deaf ears. Even Satan can appear as a good guy. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. You don't get any better than the apostle Peter. Peter was good and holy because of the grace of Jesus. And yet Peter was condemned publicly as a hypocrite by Paul. What are you talking about? Why are you guys being swayed by a person's personality. What does personality have to do with the truth and being zealous for the true God? I'm sure you would say Satan is nice if it appeared to you as an angel of light. Come on, guys. But he's such a sweet guy. I mean, when I see him, he's so nice. He makes me feel good. Makes me laugh. I mean, come on, he's such a great guy. Really? What does a person's personality 
Let me say an individual's personality got to do with the truth and being zealous for the true God. Okay, Andrew. I know you're feeling uncomfortable. Right? Okay. Is that clear? All right. I hope you now understand how not to apply. Yes, daily light. As were the Jews that came from Jerusalem, they were doing a lot of work to spread the kingdom of God, but they were preaching a false gospel. And Paul condemned them as false brothers, agents of Satan, being used by Satan. So let's forget that. But they're doing great work. Joe's witnesses are doing better work than David Lynn. So are Mormons. So you say it again, I'm going to have to send you on your merry way. That's not how you determine truth. Okay. Anyway. And I pray that God will grant him repentance. I don't want him to be condemned. But as, he, as long as he justifies giving a platform for one as heretics, may the Lord chasten him for his glory to save his flock. Because see, you're proof of my point. He's duped you. You're one of these naive sheep whom he's duped. So you just proved my point why it's dangerous. So thank you. Anyway. I pray in Jesus' name he does. We don't want to lose soldiers. We don't want to lose mighty soldiers in Christ. But remember, God doesn't need me, doesn't need him. We need, we need Jesus. We're expendable. Love Jesus more than you love me, daily light. Love Jesus more than you love David Lynn. Stop swearing allegiance to any of us. Hold us accountable to the Bible like Paul did. Paul loved Jesus more than he loved Peter. And he loved Jesus to such an extent that he condemned Peter publicly. You're not more loving, more Christ-like than Paul. Okay? So let's come back to the issue. Now that I've addressed the daily light, let's not pursue this anymore. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 6 Rob Christian, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. No, David Lynn, he's giving a platform for those who are Jesus only. L Lopez, I mean. No, Lopez. David Lynn is giving a platform for those who preach modalism and Jesus only. He's giving platforms to heretics who are anti-Trinitarian, right? Anti-Trinitarian. Everyone with me? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. And Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 16, right there. You have to love Jesus more than anything, even if it means going against me because I'm wrong, but I'm too proud and arrogant to see it. May God give me grace to be humble. Yeah. And the first to last, the only reason why he didn't bring him to the conference, folks, I don't know if you know it. He had him on his advertisement, on his Facebook. He was listed. He was one of the speakers, Marcus Rogers. You know why he disinvited him? Because I went after him in private. I have the messages. I said, I cannot come with a clear conscience and teach, knowing the next day you're going to bring this heretic. I'll come to debate him if you want. So because of that, he disinvited him. Because he was planning on to have him and fly him in. Yeah. I don't want to take credit for it. All credit to the trying God for bringing that to my attention. With that said, I've made my, my point clear. The issues are clear. We're not going to speak about him anymore. May the Lord have mercy on David and convict him to repent of this because he's misleading people by giving a platform for heretics and sons of Satan who worship a different God, a false God, not the God revealed in Jesus Christ. And may God give me the grace and sustain me to not fall away, but preserve me for his glory. I never bring him shame in Jesus' name because I'm not better than these men. And, I'm, and I mean, I'm not better than David. I'm not better than any of them. I can fall like them. God forbid any of us fall. So keep praying hard. With that said, we're going to talk about Satan, the serpent, the seraphim, and the book of Job. Are we ready? So, folks, again, let me remind you, I've explained Matthew 18, 15, 17, how not to apply it. And I gave you Galatians 2, 11 to 16. When someone sins publicly or gives a platform for, for heretics, right? Then it is your duty to publicly call that person out, publicly chasten that person, publicly rebuke that person for the benefit of the flock, not for him. You can't be silent when it's public and will affect even the weak members of the body of Christ. Because you need to love the body of Christ and be zealous for every member of the body of Christ, especially those who are weak, lest they be misled by wolves in sheep's clothing. And even those from our own midst who will fall away, taking many with them. 
to plunge into destructive heresies. That's Acts chapter 20, verses 27 to 29. Acts 20, verses 27 to 29. Now that said, Father, we love you. We love your son, the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, I ask that you grant me clarity of thought and speech. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error in the power of your Holy Spirit. Loosen my tongue. Prevent me from stammering and confusion and misinterpretation. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name, bless everyone listening and who will listen in the future. By the power of your Holy Spirit, grant us illumination to understand your word. And not just understand it, but then to live it out, which I need to do a lot more of it. Give us the power to live your word perfectly, to love you perfectly, to glorify Christ and the way we live and the way we preach. Please, Father, and increase our love for you, for your son, the Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Bless this time. Save us from attacks of the enemy. Cover us with the blood of Jesus and cleanse us by the blood of Jesus and our loved ones. In my case, my two angels, these gifts you gave me, my nine-year-old and six-year-old, bless them, Father. Be with us and save us from distractions. Protect me from being distracted and being unnecessarily offensive. And again, Father, make the sound of my voice pleasing to the ears of your servants. And that's what matters, that you be glorified in union with your son, the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the health I need to do this. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. All right. I'm going to <clears throat> discuss whether we can infer. Now, listen to me carefully, folks. Listen to me carefully. Whether we can infer that Satan may have possibly been a cherub. Let me repeat it again. Can we look at various portions of Scripture, tie them together, to come to a conclusion or make an inference that Satan may have possibly been a cherub, right? This is what I'm going to start off with because I asked you guys yesterday, do you want me to show you the scriptures that seem to indicate that Satan may have been a cherub slash seraph? And you said yes. Now, again, I have to be clear. Well, cherubim, seraphim, they are spirit, spirit creatures that are guardians of the throne. When you ask me, what are they? Spirit creatures. They are before the throne of Yahovah. They encircle his throne, right? They're known as throne guardians, right? Guardians of the throne. They are spirit creatures. Again, let me give you the chapters so that you can peruse in your own leisure and study over them. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Ezekiel's chapter 1 and 10, specifically chapter 10. We're going to look at Isaiah 6, but we're not going to look at Ezekiel. Then you read Revelation chapter 4, the entire chapter, and Revelation chapter 5. When you read those chapters together, you will discover that the creatures that Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, called the seraphim, seraphim, and the cherubim that Ezekiel saw in his vision, Ezekiel 10, when you see, because Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel in the spirit has a vision where he sees these creatures, right? And he calls them cherubim. Well, when you get to Revelation chapter 4, John is caught in the spirit. Guys, give me your undivided attention because I want you to learn. Trusting the Holy Spirit will guide me and protect me from error. John in the spirit is caught up to heaven. He's now in heaven by the Holy Spirit taking, the, taking him there. We don't know if he took him there physically or his spirit left his body temporarily and was transported into heaven. We're not told. But the Holy Spirit took John into heaven to get a glimpse of heaven. And there he saw God the Father visibly on the throne. 24 other thrones encircling God's throne. Occupied by what, what, by what he referred to as the 24 elders. Pay attention. And then he saw four living creatures encircling the throne. The description of the four living creatures... In Revelation 4, are the exact same description of the cherubim in Ezekiel 10 and the seraphim in Isaiah 6. You with me so far? You with me so far? The four living creatures that John saw in Revelation are described as the cherubim in Ezekiel 10 and the seraphim in Isaiah 6. That means, as far as John is concerned, by revelation of the Holy Spirit to him, 
the seraphim are the same as the cherubim. The cherubim are the seraphim. The seraphim are the cherubim. You didn't miss too much. We're just starting. starting. Everyone with me there? Don't take my word for it. Read these chapters together and you'll see it for yourself. Right? Is that clear? That means the seraphim are the cherubim. The cherubim are the seraphim. Okay, now, another point to add. Different names of the same class of spirit creatures that encircle the throne and guard the throne. They are guardians of God's presence. It's a sign. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, it was buffering. Hope it's better. Yeah. In Jesus' name, Father, Son, Spirit. Here we go again. How is it now? It's buffering, man. Yep. Okay. Sorry, man. You know Satan's getting angry, huh? We plead the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us. Is it okay now? And I'm not even in Illinois. I'm in uh, LA. So you know something's going on here, right? It's not buffering. Someone's telling me it's still clear. Okay. Is it clear? Because someone said it's still buffering. All right. Okay. We pray in Jesus' name that it stays good. Please, Lord Jesus, it's for your glory. You don't need us. We need you. All right. I did refresh the page. Okay. Anyway, you know Satan's getting upset. But with that said, let's come back to the issue. Let's come back to the issue. Let's focus here. Okay. Another thing I want to add. We got the fact that the seraphim are the cherubim. The cherubim are the seraphim, according to John. Another thing I want to add, and you can confirm this by reading Revelation chapters 4 and 5. In chapter 5, the four living creatures, which are the cherubim, slash seraphim, are distinguished from all the angels. In other words, according to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, you have three classes of spirit creatures. I'm not talking about human beings who now dwell in heaven as disembodied spirits. Human beings whose spirit souls have left their bodies and exist in heaven as spirits slash souls because their bodies have been buried, waiting for Jesus to then resurrect their bodies and unite their bodies with their souls slash spirits. <clears throat> Talk about spirit creatures because human beings are more than spirit creatures. Human beings are embodied spirits, creatures created to have physical bodies along with spirits slash souls. Heavenly creatures, they do have shapes, forms of some kind, but their shape and form is made of a different substance. It's not made from this earth. We know they have shapes and forms because that's the only way you'd be able to differentiate one angel from another. What do I mean? The only way I can know that's Michael standing there and that's Gabriel standing there and that's host of angels standing there is if these spirit beings have shapes and forms that distinguish them from one another. Right? If they're bodiless, shapeless, you can't distinguish them from one another. The only being... The only being that is bodiless, bodiless, shapeless, timeless, spaceless by nature is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing as one God. By their very nature, they are bodiless, shapeless, formless, timeless, which is why they can assume any and every form and shape they've created and can assume multiple forms and shapes at the same time. Now, there's only one difference with Jesus in that Jesus now took on a second nature. He added another nature to himself, the nature of humanity, a nature that he created in the blessed womb of his blessed mother, right? And that human nature is attached to his divine person forever. And part of that human nature entails having a physical body that he raised immortal and destructible, right? Is that clear? Just want to make sure. Does is that clear? Okay. 
Hopefully we don't get any distractions by the grace of God. Because there were people are asking me questions not related to the topic. Exactly, Middle East for Christ. Jesus never had a body before he came down because God by nature is bodiless. God by nature is shapeless and formless and timeless. But because he created all shapes and forms and created time, space, and place, he can now enter space, enter time, and assume a shape and form and not be bound to it. No, people have seen Jesus' form. That's the reason why he took a form, Lopez, so that people could see him visibly. All right? I just want to make sure. Okay. With that said, in Revelation 5, the four living creatures are distinguished from the angels, meaning if Satan is a cherub, a seraph, then he's not an angelic creature. Because in Revelation 5, the angels are distinguished from the four living creatures, meaning... That though Michael is an archangel, Gabriel is an angel, Satan, if he's a cherub, he is not an angel like them. You with me there? I hope I don't bore you with this stuff, and I hope really it's illuminating you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. What's the proof? Now, in the comments section, in the comments section, I'm going to link all these verses. With the Hebrew words transliterated and placed within parentheses, I can't do that now for the live stream. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the links. Okay, I'm going to give you the links, but I'm going to read them. Now, Protestant believer, you don't need to, well, yeah, you don't need to quote them now. I'll let you know when to quote verses, Protestant. Right now, I'm just going to read it. I have the verses with the Hebrew words and transliteration in parentheses. I can't post them. They're too lengthy. But Lord willing, once this video is done, I'll put them in the description box. But I will give you the link. What proof is there that may lead us to infer and conclude that Satan may have been a cherub? Well, we're going to start with Genesis chapter 3. Let me get you the link, you guys, to verify this for yourselves. This is the link to the interlinear Bible provided by BibleHub.com. One of the best online resources for the Bible. It's excellent. Thank the Lord for modern technology and for all these free resources that we need to take advantage of. Here you go. Click on it. There you're going to see that the word for serpent is nachash. Nachash. I want you to click on it. We're going to read. I'm going to read. And then I'll post these in the description box to the video. Lord willing. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 4. And then Genesis chapter 3, verses 13 and 15. Click on it and see that the word for serpent is ha-nachash. Ha is the definite article in Hebrew. Ha-nachash. Make sure I look skinny. I don't want to see my love angels. All right, let me read. Now the serpent, ha-nachash, was more subtle, Hebrew is arum, than any beast of the field which Yahovah Elohim, the Lord God, had made. And he said to the woman, has God said, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Hanachash, the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of, from the trees of the garden, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you will not eat of it, nor will you touch it, or else you will die. Then the serpent, Hanachash, said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, I don't, I don't think I need to read 13 and 15. I think you get the idea. The word serpent is nachash. I want to make sure you got it. The Hebrew word is nachash. You got it? You remember nachash. It's going to be important. Now, how do we know it's Satan? Well, that's where the New Testament comes in. The New Testament tells us this serpent wasn't an animal, but was a spirit creature that for all intents and purposes looks serpentine. In other words... According to Revelation, the serpent is not an animal, but a spirit creature. And the reason why he's called a serpent is because most likely he resembled a serpent. His shape was serpentine. You with me there? His shape was serpentine. And we even find an archaeological depictions in the ancient Near Eastern cultures. Serpentine 
serpent-like creatures, heavenly creatures that looked like serpents. So this was something even known to the ancient Near Eastern peoples, that there are a group of creatures that look serpentine, that are serpent-like. And you can just Google it. Again, thank God for modern technology. You'll find in the in the what they call in the reliefs, these drawings, these depictions in the ancient Eastern cultures of serpent-like creatures, spirit creatures that look serpentine, right? You, you understand what I'm talking about, right? And Zarina says they believe that in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how do we know this is Satan? Revelation 12, 9, Protestant believer, Revelation 12, 9, and Revelation 20, verse 2. Revelation 12, 9, and Revelation 20, verse 2. How you doing, Brother Allen? God bless you. Watch here. How do you know it's Satan? Because John tells us in Revelation by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Interestingly, this same devil, Satan called that old serpent, the serpent of old, who deceives the whole world, is doing just that in the garden, deceiving Adam and Eve. Notice his MO, his modus operandi. He's been deceiving from the very beginning of his creation, right? He not only deceives the whole world, he deceived Adam and Eve to distrust God. But did you notice Revelation 12, 9? He is said to be that old serpent. What old serpent? The serpent of old, the serpent in Genesis. And then Revelation 20, verse 2. Revelation 20, verse 2. Admins, make sure you're controlling the texting. And if you see trolls, send them on their merry way. Revelation 20, verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. I want you to pay attention to what John did not say. You ready? I want you to pay attention to what John did not say. John did not say that Satan possessed a serpent. John did not say that Satan, that Satan resembles a serpent. John said Satan is a serpent. He is a dragon. In other words, if you let... Revelation inform your reading of Genesis 3. The serpent in the garden is not an animal. That serpent is a spirit creature. That serpentine, serpent-like. Is that clear? Sam Price already addressed Ezekiel 28 yesterday, brother. You were here. Let's not repeat the same points. Here we go. Here goes Hater Wood wanting Hater Aid. Hey, I'm honored that at least you come and you distract us in the in the comment section. Hater Aid is here. All right. Man, you're such a hater. You get about a thousand views when you do a live stream. I barely get 200. And you're hating on me? We still love you, though. The great white dope. I mean, hope. All right. Okay, let's come back to the issue. Okay. So that we have now established that Satan is the serpent, right? Not an image of a serpent, Rick. He is a serpent, and the reason why he's called a serpent is because for all intents and purposes, Satan's spiritual form and shape would be serpent-like, serpentine. You get my point? It's not simply an image of a serpent. He is the serpent. He looks like a serpent, which may suggest, and I can't be dogmatic about it. See, I'm very, being very cautious. I'm treading lightly, trusting the Spirit to guide me and protect me from error. It's most likely the fact that the reason why Satan is called a serpent is because he looks like a serpent in, a, in the sense that when you see a shape, it's serpent-like, it's serpentine. So he is a serpent and looks like a serpent, but he's not an animal. He's a spirit creature that's serpent-like, serpentine in his shape and form. I'm, I'm making sense. I'm not confusing you. You with me there? Because you're going to now find in Isaiah, there are spirit creatures that are serpent-like, reptilian-looking, exactly, Semper, that look like serpents. That's their shape. That's their form. That's what they look like. And so they're being identified by the way they look. And I'm going to show you that in Isaiah 6. And that's going to be one of the arguments I will use to lead to the conclusion that Satan may have been a cherub, a seraph. Is that clear? Did we make the connection that the serpent is the devil? And the reason why he's called the serpent? 
because his spiritual shape was serpentine, reptilian-like. And how does this connect them with the seraph of Isaiah 6? That's where I'm getting, getting to. What was the Hebrew word for serpent? It was nachash, right? It was nachash, right? Okay. If we got that, let me move on to Isaiah 6. Nachash, Isaiah 6. Oh, my goodness. I didn't get the link. Hold on. Let me get you the link to Isaiah 6. Okay. You can now read the Hebrew for yourself. And, it, again, the word is seraphim. So the, it, seraphim in English is a transliteration of it. But here you go. Here it is. I want you to go and click Isaiah 6. I'm going to read verses 1 to 7. There you go. Isaiah 6. Yeah, 1 means yes. We get you. 2 means no, we don't. All right. Now, when you go here in Isaiah 6, you're going to see for yourself in verse 2, the word is seraphim. And seraphim is a transliteration of the Hebrew. Seraphim is simply the Hebrew word in transliteration. Okay? I want you to pay attention to how Isaiah describes these beings. I'm going to read it now, Protestant. Protestant, I'm going to read Isaiah 6, 1 to 7, because I want you to catch the language. And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord Adonai sitting on a throne. And by the way, I'm using modern English version, modernized King James. High and lifted up, and a train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Now, you know what that means. In Hebrew, it's seraphim. Remember, saraf is singular. Seraphim, the em makes it plural. Saraf, seraphim, plural. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. So notice, these spirit creatures can fly. Pay attention, and it's going to be important. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the door moved at the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Yahovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. Ha, seraphim in Hebrew, flew. So they fly. Pay attention. They fly. With the live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar in his hand, and he laid it on my mouth and said, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Now, these beings are called seraphim. Seraf is singular. Seraphim is plural. They fly. They have wings and they fly. Because here I want you to catch something. Now, in Isaiah 14, 29. Hold on. No caller ID. Let me see what it is. Hello? Hello? I'm doing a live show. Can you be quick? Yeah. Secret and Meyer are calling me with no caller ID. Okay? Yeah? Facebook Live. All right. Go ahead. I got secret admirers, folks. They're calling me no idea. It means I'm, someone loves me, but they're embarrassed to let me know who it is. You love me? Just let me know who you are. All right. Now, here's the verse. Oh, I can't post it all. Forget about it. Go to Isaiah 14, 29. Isaiah 14, 29. Let me break it down. Okay, let me break it down. Okay, okay click on the link. Go to Isaiah 14, 29. Let me read it, and let me bring out the implication of this passage. Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, because the rod that struck you is broken. For out of the serpent's root, guess what the word for serpent here is? Nachash. Pay attention here. Nachash. Here's the link, folks. Confirm it for yourselves. Out of the root of the serpent, Nachash, what will come out? Let's read. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a viper, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Folks. Guess what the word for serpent is in this passage? Saraf. Seraph. Notice here a serpent is called Nachash and a flying serpent is called Seraph. Connecting Nachash with Seraph. A Nachash is a Seraph. Seraph. A Seraph is a Nachash. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Click on the link and read it for yourself. The root of a serpent, Nachash, and a fiery flying seraph. Did you catch it? Seraph, which the translation renders as serpent. And in Isaiah 6, those seraphim flew. 
Meaning, if you take the word seraph in Isaiah 14, 29, and see that it's being used as a synonym for Nachash, so the ser serpent, Nachash, is the seraph, because it's the offspring of a serpent, making it a serpent. That means a seraph is a Nachash, a Nachash is a seraph, meaning a seraph is reptilian-like. A serpent, you catch it? That means the seraphim were reptilian-like, serpentine. They're called a seraph or seraphim because they're reptilian in their shape. But these seraphim are the cherubim. Do you get it so far before I move on? It's going to be clear when we go to Numbers 21, 49. Did you catch it? Isaiah 14, 29. From the root of a serpent, Nachash, will come a viper that gives birth to a fiery flying serpent. Serpent there is seraph. So a Nachash, the offspring of Nachash is a seraph. Serpent, Nachash, fiery flying serpent, seraph. Seraph, Nachash, Nachash, seraph. They're being used synonymously. Clear? Shema, before I move on. Yes, Andrew Martin, you got it. A cherub is a seraph, and a seraph is a flying, serpentine, reptilian spirit creature. Andrew, you got it. Muzzle this dog, Bob Dole, because he's upset. He still doesn't know who his father is. You with me there? Everyone got it? Before I move on to the next line of evidence? No. It's irrelevant how many number of wings they have, David Walker. Why are you making this an issue when Hebrews tells you that spirit creatures are designed in such a way that can be shape shifters? They can assume different shapes and forms. All right. Now, let's go to Numbers 21, 4 to 9. My second line of evidence. Let me give you the link. Okay. Let me give you the link. Numbers 21, 49. That's for the Hebrew. Let me read. Now, guys, here's where you're going to see that the serpents that bit the Israelites, here they'll be called Ha Nachashim, Ha Sarafim. Ha Nachashim, Ha Sarafim. They're called Nachash and they're called Saraf. They're called both. You ready? Numbers 21, 4 to 9. You got the link? Numbers 21, 4 to 9. You got the link, right? Okay, let's let's begin reading. So Yahovah, the Lord, sent fiery. Guess what the word fiery is, folks? Ha Sarafim. Fiery serpents. Ha Nachashim. Wow. These serpents are called. Seraphim Nachashim. The, the serpent that bit them is a Nachash and a Seraph. Do you guys see that? It's right there in your interlinear. Fiery is the Hebrew word Seraph, and serpent is Nachash. Seraphim plural, Ha Seraphim, Ha Nachashim. Did you catch it or no? Are you saying that these serpents that bit the Israelites are called seraphim, seraphim and nachashim? They are seraphs and they are serpents. I mean, nachashim. <laughs> Try to transliterate the Hebrew. Click on the link. Here you go to see. What are the Hebrew words for fiery serpents? What are the Hebrew words for fiery serpents? I know you're upset because you can't get who your father is right. It's all right. Forgive your mother. Don't hate her. It's being Christ-like. All right. Now, let's read. Let's read. Let's continue reading. So, Yahovah, the Lord, sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many children of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahovah and against you. Pray to Yahovah 
And he will take away the serpents. Guess what the word serpents is? Nachash. Same word used of the devil. And Moses prayed for the people. Yahweh said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Guess what the word there is? Seraph. Seraph. Make a seraph and put it on a pole. And it will be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, will live. Moses made a bronze serpent. Nachash. Did you see how the words are being used interchangeably? God says, make a seraph, fiery serpent. And Moses made a nachash. The nachash is the seraph, seraph. The seraph, seraph is the nachash. They're being used synonymously. So a seraph is none other than a nachash. A seraph is a serpent, reptilian figure, as is a nachash. Moses made a bronze serpent nachash and put it on a pole. And if a serpent, ha-nachash, had bitten any man, when he looked at the bronze serpent nachash, he lived. Did you get it or no? Are you seeing that in these contexts, a nachash serpent is a seraph or seraph? A seraph is a nachash. A nachash is a seraph in these contexts. I'm not saying every serpent is a seraph. But here you see the seraphim of Isaiah 6, right? That word seraph is used elsewhere to denote flying serpents. So the seraphim, they fly, and they're called seraphim because most likely they were reptilian in their shape, serpentine in their shape, serpent-like. And then we saw that the word seraph is used interchangeably with nachash. Nachash is the Hebrew word serpent, and seraph can mean fiery or a fiery serpent. So you see in these places, a nachash is a seraph, seraph, a seraph, seraph is a nachash. Is that clear? Yep, hit the like button. Is it clear before I move on? So we now have established with good evidence from Scripture that the seraphim of Isaiah 6 are reptilian-like spirit creatures, serpentine spirit creatures, which is why they're called seraphim. Now, if that's the case, I've also established that a seraph, seraph, is also called a nachash, serpent. What is Satan called in Genesis 3? A nachash, a serpent. So when we take all these passages and tie them together, we can make a case. Pay attention, folks. We can make a case that Satan is called a nachash because he's, he's a reptilian like creature, a serpentine creature, his shape is serpentine, reptilian like, which is why he's called a serpent. And if he's a serpent, then that means you can make a case he's one of those reptilian spirit creatures. In other words, he was one of the seraphim. Well, if he's one of the seraphim, according to John and Revelation 4 and 5, the seraphim are the cherubim. So if Satan is called a nachash, a serpent, because he's a reptilian like spirit creature, a serpentine spirit creature that would connect them with the seraphim of Isaiah 6. Well, if that's the case, he happens to be one of the seraphim who ended up rebelling. Well, the seraphim are the same as the cherubim, according to John in Revelation 4 and 5. If you read Ezekiel 10 and Isaiah 6 in light of Revelation chapters 4 and 5, therefore you can come to the conclusion that Satan was one of the cherubs that fell. You catch it? And the final reference to the fiery serpents in the Old Testament, right? The reference to the fiery serpents that bit the Israelites who are called Hanachashim HaSerafim, right? HaSerafim HaNachashim. The final reference is 2 Kings 18.4, where it says, King Hezekiah destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses made because the Israelites were making offerings to it, worshiping it, treating it as a god, an idol, calling it Nehushtan, and he destroyed it. 2 Kings 18.4, here you go. Okay. Let me give you the link.
Okay. Is that clear? Orbiters, you switched your, your links, right? Uh, why does he call him a dragon? Well, it's like, why does he call him a serpent? Obviously, because he can take the shape and form of a dragon. And what is a dragon if not an oversized serpent, right? A humongous oversized serpent, correct? And by the way, dragon would be a pre-scientific term for dinosaurs. So people say, well, dragons don't exist. Well, what do you think a dinosaur is? To an ancient culture, you think they're going to use a modern term, dinosaur? Right? So a dragon is a pre-scientific term referring to what we today call a dinosaur. No, Roscoe, all cherubim are seraphim. All seraphim are cherubim, according to John, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Read Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 10, and Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Yeah, I know, they never existed. Okay. Is that clear, everyone? Now, notice that nothing I showed you was explicit, right? Nothing in the Bible explicitly said, and Satan was a cherub, and Satan was a seraph. It's an inference you can make. It's an inference you can make by taking these different passages of Scripture and tying them together and drawing a conclusion from them. But the fact still remains, there is nothing in the Bible that comes out and says, black and white, Satan was a serpent. I'm sorry, Satan was a seraph. Satan was a cherub, right? So you can make an inference. You can make an inference. You can draw a conclusion and argue this seems to support the fact of Satan being a cherub, a seraph before he fell. But since it's not explicit, it's not black and white, all it is is an inference. You can reject it or accept it, right? You can accept it or reject it. So I'm showing you that you can tie these passages in together and make that inference and come to a conclusion and even believe it. Yeah, now I'm convinced he's a seraph, a cherub. But always be humble enough to the possibility you may be wrong and that when we get to glory, we'll find out the truth about what Satan was before he rebelled. After all, God could have made it easy and simply came out in black and white and said, hey, Satan was a seraph. Satan was a cherub. But he chose not to make it that clear which means he wants us to be humble and not dogmatic about the issue. You with me there? Do not be dogmatic if the Bible is not dogmatic. Don't be more clear than the Bible is. Brunei, Nuk Brunei, I did an entire session as equal 28. I'm not going to repeat myself. Go listen to it. Right? You want me there? Is that clear? If there's anyone confused, let me know because I want to move to the book of Job. Anyone confused or everyone got it? Zena, you got it as well? I know Duck Kenno. You're still a friend. Duck, why are you upset at me that you don't know who your father is and taking out your anger on me? Forgive your mother and accept her for the sake of Christ, bro. What's wrong with you, dude? It's okay, Doc. We still love you. Now, can I move into Satan, the book of Job? Because now we're going to go into some meat. They're both descriptive, right? I mean, because he gives us a description of what the cherubim look like. So I don't know what you mean functional and descriptive, right? Because even Revelation 4 and 5, Ezekiel 10, we're told what they look like, not, not just what they do, right? JJ, it's not simply what they do function. It's what, how they appear, what they look like. And the looks that they assume obviously are pointing to something. It's, it's imagery that's supposed to point out to something, highlight something, right? But anyway, a seraphim or the seraphim are the cherubim, the cherubim are the seraphim. That's John. Since John is filled with the Holy Spirit, JJ, and the Holy Spirit revealed it to John, 
A Christian who's committed to the New Testament cannot argue to the contrary. You cannot say the seraphim are not the cherubim because John has settled the matter for Christians. If you're a Christian who loves Jesus Christ and believes the New Testament is the inspired truth of God, John settles it because John is filled with the Spirit, inspired by the Spirit, and by the Spirit telling us, by the Spirit telling us that though four living creatures resemble the seraphim of Isaiah 6 and the cherubim of Ezekiel 10, end of story, case closed, if you are a Christian. Shadow skill. If I have to repeat myself again, we're going to send you on your merry way. Okay? So ask me that question again so I can see how insincere you are in listening. So I'm not like, you know, hater would. He wants all the viewers he can get. So let people just mock him and attack him, which he deserves, not me. Okay? All right. Are we ready for Joe? You guys excited? By the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God, the Spirit of the Father and Son, fill us for the glory of Jesus. You guys excited? You guys ready? Before I even begin, was this a blessing to see that the seraphim, that word set off, is also the word referring to serpents that fly. And the word seraph is used interchangeably with the word for serpent, nachash. A seraph can be a nachash, and nachash can be a seraph. And if Satan is a nachash, that means he's reptilian in his shape, serpentine, which may connect them with the seraphim of Isaiah 6 who rebel and therefore connect with the cherubim. Bam! That's a mic drop. Bam! All right. Now, let's talk about Job. Here's what I want you guys to do. We're going to take a moment. I want you to read Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 22. Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 22. And then Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now, if you want me to read it aloud, then here I'm going to need your help. If we're going to have Orbiter posting... If we're going to have Orbiter posting, then please cut back on the comments because I want to read it with you. Let's read because I'm going to unpack it, all right? Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 22. So do you want him to post and we read together? Or you don't? You just want me to read it and him not post? If you want him to post, put a 1 or say yes. Okay. All right. Since you said yes, cut back on the texting so we can read. Go ahead, my brother Orbiter. Let's post. Job 1, 6 to 22. And I'm going to highlight some important key Text. Okay, let's read. Thank you, brother. Let's read. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yehovah, and Satan came also among them. Notice there are three groups here. Sons of God, Jehovah, and Satan. Three groups. Highlight that. If you have a Bible that you're highlighting or underlining, underline that. And Yehovah said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Where are you coming from? Then Satan answered Yehovah and said, From going to and fro in, in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Okay. <clears throat> and Yalva said, once comes down, and then let's read. And Yalva said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Notice he's asking the question. Have you considered Job that there's none like him in the earth? A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and is true with evil, avoids evil. Now watch here. Let's read. Okay. Then Satan answered the Lord Yahweh and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Does he fear you for nothing? Hast thou not made an hedge about him? You've protected him. You've shielded him. And about his house, you put a shield around him that no one can touch him. I can't touch him. <clears throat> right? And about all that ha he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. He doesn't love you from a pure heart. He doesn't love you unconditionally. There's no altruism in Job. He loves you because of the blessings and the benefits. Now notice 12. Let's continue reading. Read with me, 12. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Now God gives him permission. All that he owns is in your authority. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of Yehovah. Notice he gives him permission how much he can do. All that he owns, you can mess with, but do not touch him. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, 
And the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only escaped alone to tell thee. Now let's read 16. While, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in thy, their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind, a wind, a tempest, right? Like these tornadoes and the floods we're experiencing. Pay attention to that. A great wind, like these tornadoes, these floods. A great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. I came into the world with nothing. I came into the world with no children, no possession, no wife, no clothes, and naked shall I return thither. I entered naked, I leave naked, I take nothing with me. Yehovah gave and Yehovah hath taken away. Blessed be the name of Yehovah. And all this Job said not nor charge God foolishly. Okay. Did you catch it? Okay, let me unpack this before we go to Job 2. Number one, you learn, guys, pay attention. Number one, you learn, Satan as a spirit creature has great power over the elements. The wind that struck the house down and killed the children. That win was caused by who in the context? You remember what God said? I, I put all things in your power, but do not touch him. So here you learn that spirit creatures, evil spirits, and righteous spirits have power to manipulate the natural elements, have power over the wind, have power over the seas, have power over the waves, have power over earthquakes, have power over volcanoes. They can cause natural disasters, what we call natural evil. So don't assume that a tornado that struck was caused by God. Don't assume a tsunami that hit was caused by God. It can be an act of God or it can be an act of Satan or evil spirits bringing this natural disaster with God's permission to make people hate God and blame God for that disaster. Are you with me there? Of course, God has to permit what happens. But are you with me there? Did you understand what you just read? It's not that God wants people to hate him, right? Why would God want people to hate him? Zena, Satan wants you to hate God. And so Satan brings these natural disasters upon us to question God, as opposed to saying that it's Satan who did it, and he did it to make you question God and hate him. Now, God has his reasons for permitting it. Zena, let's try this again, sister. God has his reasons for permitting it. And I'm going to show you why he permits it in the case of Job. So you're already jumping the gun because you're getting troubled. Why would God do that? Now the woman in you is kicking in. Earlier, it was the Assyrian in you when you wanted to be bold and put me in my place. But now the mushy-gushy emotion. But why would he do this? <laughs> Control your emotions, sister. We'll get there. Be patient. Okay? Why don't you go to law school so you can be a doctor so you can have a lot of patience? Anyway, put that aside. Eli, but you're not a woman. What's wrong with you, dude? All right. So, so far, are you seeing in the scriptures that spirit creatures, good or bad, have the power to manipulate the natural elements, right? They can cause earthquakes, tsunamis, tidal waves, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions. You see that, right? They can also stir up people to murder, stir up bandits to steal and murder. Like Satan stirred up Muhammad and his jihadi thugs to murder and rape and enslave. No one acts without God permitting it. Even if they try, if God doesn't want to, he can stop them, Sam Price. Let's not get into theodicy. See, now notice what you guys are doing here. 
You want me to talk about Satan, but now you want to change the subject about theodicy. How can a good God allow evil? So what do you want me to talk about? Hold your horses, guys. <laughs> Let's talk about this. In the meantime, you can whet your appetites and listen to YouTube lectures by William Lane Craig and others on God and evil. Focus. Send Dennis. I can't do both. We got to do one at a time. Right? John Connor, please. I know your mother, Sarah Connor, has upset you because you don't know who your father is. Come on, man. It's okay. Forgive her, you son of Satan. All right. Now, let's come back to Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Yes, Eli, the Bible says evil spirits and righteous spirits. Now, let's break, break down Job 2, verses 1 to 10. Guys, read with me. Slow down in the chat. Read with me because I want to bring out some more implications of Satan. Job 2, verses 1 to 10. Okay, read. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahovah, and Satan came also among them to present himself before Yahovah. Notice three groups again, three groups. Sons of God, Jehovah, and Satan, three groups. Don't forget, three groups. And Yahovah said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? Where are you coming? And Satan answered, Yahovah, the Lord. And said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. I've been traveling the earth. Okay? Traveling the earth. Now watch verse 3, folks. Watch verse 3. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is true with evil, shuns evil? And he still, notice this, verse 3, he still holds fast his integrity. You said he was going to blaspheme my name. He proved you a liar. Although you moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Verse 4, and Satan answered Yahovah and said, skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. You know why he didn't curse you? Because if you'll let me attack him physically and ail him physically, he'll cuss you in your face. Now notice verse 5. But put forth thine hand now, God, you put your hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now notice 6. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life, meaning his soul. Now notice, at first he said, I put his possessions in your hand, but don't touch him. Now he says, okay, touch him, but do not touch his soul. His soul is off limits. You have permission to do to his body as you see fit. That's verse 6. 7. And so went Satan forth from the presence of Yahovah and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. On our three, eight to ten. We're almost done. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Get it over with. God doesn't care about you. Then who cares about God? Get it over with. Get this God. He don't care about you. Look what he did to us. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. You speak like a fool. What? Shall receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Okay. Now are you ready to bring out another implication of this passage? Here you see spirit creatures. I like that, Brian. <laughs> spirit creatures. It's okay. He's a brother. Don't, don't block him. He's a brother. Spirit creatures, whether good or evil, have the power to inflict people with diseases. Did you catch it? Some diseases are the result of spirit oppression. Some diseases are the work of Satan. Some diseases are inflicted upon us by evil spirits. Because here it says, Satan went out and he struck Job with boils that were painful. So are you learning a lot more about the spirit realm? Number one, how real the spirit realm is. And number two, the kind of power that these spirit creatures have. Power that put us to shame. Power that we cannot rival. Power that we cannot resist. Apart from the power of the holy blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Spirit being our shield. Which is why the Bible warns you, don't play with Satan. Don't tempt Satan. 
Don't curse Satan because he's a force that you cannot reckon with. Don't play with him. The only power you have against him is the holy blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Spirit being your shield. Yes, he is a real story. Don't let someone tell you otherwise. Okay, so you learn that much about Satan, right? He has power to inflict you physically with disease. He has power to manipulate the natural elements, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, whirlwinds, tsunami. He can do it. And other spirit creatures can do it. You got that or no? Let me know if you got it. If you're confused, put it to her. Say I don't because I want to unpack it now because we've got a lot of meat. Clear? Another thing you learn. Another thing you learn. Let's go to Job 2 verse 3. Another thing you learn. Job 2 verse 3. Born you? Job 2 verse 3. Watch here. Let's hear. Look what we learn here. And Yahovah said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Here's what you learn. You learn that oftentimes God takes responsibility for things he did not do. Let me repeat again. Please pay attention. I want you to learn your Bible to know how to properly answer Oftentimes, God takes responsibility for actions he didn't commit. It was Satan who struck his family dead. It was Satan who raised up bandits to kill his servants and rob Job. It was Satan who inflicts Job with a disease. And God said, you move me against him to destroy him. You hear me there? God is taking responsibility for the evil, the disaster that fell upon Job, though God didn't do anything, it was Satan. Everyone getting it? What's the point? Be careful how you read the Bible when the Bible ascribes something to God, because in the Bible, things that others do are often ascribed to God, even though God didn't do it and didn't desire it. So then why is it attributed to God? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, nothing can happen if God doesn't permit it. So in that sense, he's taking responsibility, though he doesn't do it, though he may not delight in what you're doing, but he allows you to do it. And he has his reasons. Is that clear? Yes, medic for Christ. Exactly. Like the evil spirit that torments all. Let me give you another example where God takes credit for something he doesn't do. God takes credit for something he didn't do. Exodus 12, 12. Send this guy with the name, the Lord is Jesus on his merry way. Exodus 12, 12. Watch here. You're going to learn a lot by the grace of God's spirit if you're patient. Watch here. Exodus 12, 12. Orbiter this year before the rapture. Just kidding. Okay. For some reason, Orbiter, it's po posting it backwards, but that's fine. God's saying to Moses, for I'll pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will ex execute judgment. I am Yehovah. You see what God said? I will smite. I will kill. I will strike down the firstborn of Egypt. Do you guys see it? Who's going to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians and the cattle? God says, I'll do it, right? <clears throat> do you guys see it? I just want to make sure you're seeing it. God has said he's going to do it, right? But wait, wait. Exodus 12, 23, same chapter, same book. Exodus 12, 23, same chapter, same book. Exodus 12, 23, same chapter, same book. Watch here. For Yahovah will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel of the top and on the two side posts, Yahovah will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Wait, 
Now it's not God who's going to smite the firstborn, but the destroyer. And God is going to stop him from destroying your firstborn when he sees the blood. He's going to say, hey, no, not that house. Pass over it. So why did God say, I'm going to smite the firstborn, even though here we're told it's not God, but the destroyer. And God will tell the destroyer, that house, don't enter. That one do. That one, don't touch them. That one, touch. So notice again, God takes, a, takes responsibility for an act he did not commit. Why? Because ultimately, nothing can take place in the earth if God doesn't permit it. Even things that he doesn't like and he hates that he allows you to do, and he has a reason why he allows you to do it. Right? Are you getting it now? Are you understanding the language of the Bible? So when it says, well, God said I create evil. Well, what does that mean? See? Someone just quoted Isaiah 45, 7. See, I anticipated that, just like Ezra. Isaiah 45, 7 is where he says I create evil. See? It's like the Spirit put that in my mouth to correct you. Isaiah 45, 7, where it says I create evil. What does that mean? Right? Isn't it amazing? I just said, like, when God says, I create evil, and this guy just posted Isaiah 45, 7, the very passage where it says, God says, I create evil. Wow, confirmation from the Lord. What does it mean he creates evil? What does it mean he's going to kill the firstborn? What does it mean that he stretched out his hand to strike Job? Yep, it is this power of the Holy Spirit working through us. Anyway. That's one thing I wanted you to learn. God will take responsibility for actions that others commit, even actions he hates and despises, but he tolerates and he permits. Yep, exactly, Jerry Wang. Is that clear? Is that clear? Now let's look at some other things. Let's go to back, back to Job chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Yep, he is always. Job chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. Let's unpack this. Job chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. Watch here. And Yahweh said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered Yahovah and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. Okay, now let's read, let's unpack this. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holds fast his integrity, although thou, you move me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, what else do we learn from here? Notice that Satan is not omnipresent. He has to travel to and fro the earth from place to place because he can't be in more than one place at the same time in the same way. Satan is not like God. He's not omnipresent. Satan is not like God. He's not omnipresent. He can get to places much faster than you and I, but still he has to travel because he's a spirit creature bound to time, space, and place, though he can travel much faster than you and I. I can't answer that question, Eli. How do I know? Unless God reveals it. You with me there? Traveling to and fro the earth, up and down the earth. Why? Because he's not omnipresent. So he has to travel from place to place, although he does so rapidly at a speed that we cannot come close to. Now, the question is, why is he traveling throughout the earth? Verse 3 tells you. Let's look at verse 3 one more time. Let's look at verse 3 one more time. One more time. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Let me implant what he means. Satan, I know why you are here. You've been traveling the earth for a victim, and you found one. You've been focusing and considering and have your eyes on my servant Job. And you're here to ask me permission to tempt him. So God is exposing what's in his heart. Did you catch it? I know why you're here. 
you found a victim, which is why you've come to me, approaching me to ask me whether you can test him. After all, why did he stop traveling to and fro the earth? And why is he now appearing in heaven? Because he found his victim. And this is confirmed in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 to 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Let's go to 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9 and unpack. The reason why Satan prowls the earth is to find someone to attack. He found someone and now he goes before God and God says, I know why you're here. You have your eyes on my servant Job. You've been considering my servant Job, haven't you? 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. No, virtual warfare. He came to heaven because he had considered Job. You're not understanding the point. You're wrong. The reason why he went to heaven is because he saw Job and was considering him. So he had to go to God to get permission. And God says, you've been considering my servant Job, haven't you? Now, 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Be faithful and trust in God and resist him by trusting in Jesus, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So do you understand why he now finally left the earth and went back to heaven? Moon, I answer this the umpteen time. I'm going to answer the final time. Please don't ask me a question I've answered already. Because he cannot do anything without God permitting it. What a bop before it. He was traveling to find someone virtual. He found someone and went to heaven to get permission. I don't think it's hard to understand what I'm saying. Virtual, let me make it easy for you. Why did he stop traveling the earth and go to heaven? Why did he stop going to and fro the earth and now go to heaven? Why? That means he found a victim virtual and now needs to get God's permission. So God is beating him to the punch. I know why you're here. You've, you've been eyeing my servant Job. You've considered my servant Job, haven't you? And the reason why you've been considering my servant Job, because you realize there's none like him. He's the most righteous man in all the earth. Did we get that point so I can move on to the other points? What's that got to do with the fact that he's in the heaven where God dwells visibly, Ewan? Don't bring up irrelevant issues that there are three heavens. What's that got to do with the fact that he's in the heaven where God dwells visibly on the throne and angels are there? Okay, now let's go to back to Job 2 verse 1. Zina, Satan has to have permission to do anything he does. But does that mean he has to ask God every time he does it? No. When he goes against someone and he does something evil and is successful, that means God permitted it. So he doesn't always have to get permission directly. You get my point, Zina? He doesn't always have to appear before God and get permission directly. He'll try something. If he's successful, that means God permitted it. If not, he failed. That means, oh, God stopped me. Right? But we do find in the Bible that in these situations, he has to get direct permission directly. Right? Okay, now, let's go back to Job 2.1. Let's go back to Job 2.1. Are you ready now? Okay. Again, there was a day the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahovah, and Satan came also among them to present himself before Yahovah. Do not ask me any question that's not related to the topic, folks. They're going to get blocked. Okay, now, how many characters are in this scene? How many characters are in this scene? Three, right? Yahovah, Satan, and the sons of God, which are spirit creatures. Now, here's my question for every one of you. Why do you think the inspired author of Job mentions in Job 1.6 and Job 2.1 that the sons of God were there? Why didn't he just simply say, Satan approached the Lord? End of story. Why does he have to mention another group? 
the sons of God, who are spirit creatures. Not only because he's a different being. Forget that. That's not the issue. It's more than that. And here's where you're going to, I'm going to answer your question, Zina. One of the reasons why God allows Satan to uh, ha uh, wreak havoc on us, Zina, is because he is going to vindicate us in the eyes of heaven. No, not because they need permission. Brian got it and Brian damaged. Both of you got it. Because they are witnesses to this conversation. They are witnesses to this conversation. Now, let me unpack that. Are you ready? Notice what Satan is doing. Notice what Satan's doing. God just said in front of the angels, guys, I need you to listen now. Stop the questions. Listen, because it's going to bless you now. God had just said in front of the angels, Job is a righteous man who fears me. There's none like him in the earth. Satan now questioned God's judgment in front of the angels. Oh, really? You really think he's righteous? I beg to differ. The only reason why he's righteous is because you bless him. Strike him down, he'll curse you to your face. In other words, Satan was causing the angels to doubt God's wisdom, <clears throat> God's statement, God's assessment of his servant Job. He did two things. He called into question Job's integrity and called into question God's judgment in front of the angels. You know why? Because Satan wants to cause these sons of God to doubt God's integrity and judgment in order to cause them to sin against God. You see how evil he is? And the very presence of God in heaven. Are you with me? So I said slow down on the texting so you can understand. Are you catching what's happening here? Spirit creatures are imperfect in the sense that they are not almighty, all-powerful, and impeccable, meaning they are prone to sinning. How do we know? Because Satan was a spirit creature who sinned. So here are the sons of God, and they're hearing this conversation. They're hearing God say, that man, Job, is righteous as unlike him. They're hearing the adversary saying, not really. That's what you think, God. The only reason why he fears you is because of the blessing. Take away the blessing, he'll curse you before your face. Now, God could have reacted and says, get, get behind me, go to hell, Satan. But would that have assuaged the doubts of the sons of God? Or if you reacted that way, would that have caused them to think, why was God so rush, so quick to rebuke Satan and cast him out? Did Satan hit a nerve? You understand if God simply silenced Satan and told him, go to hell, get out of my presence, the sons of God would have started thinking, man, Satan hit a nerve, didn't he? Because look how angry God got. Why did he get so angry if Satan was lying? In other words, Satan now put God in a situation where now he has to not only vindicate Job in front of the angels, but also vindicate himself in front of the angels so that the angels would see Satan is a liar, never trust him and always trust me and have no doubts concerning my judgment. In other words, God was not only fighting for Job's integrity, he was trying to protect the salvation of the sons of God from having sin in their hearts, thereby bringing God's wrath upon them. So he was trying to protect several groups the angels before him and Job on earth. Exactly, Mendes. Zina, this shows that you're blind and don't have an eternal perspective. It really sucks that his sons and daughters died in righteousness so that now they're dwelling with Jesus forever and now Job is with them forever where death will never sever them again and now they're crowned with the with the crown of life and living in perfect glory really it sucks you see you're having an earthly pers perspective which is blinding you Zena. if god is real and he is when the children died where did they go they're now in the presence of god with job living forever in perfect peace love and joy no more pain suffering and death and it still sucks okay if you want to see it that way.
You with me there? I know you're being a woman, Zena. Sorry, ladies, don't attack me. It's the emotions. I love you, Jesus. It's all right. We know. Okay. Now, do you see the beauty, the humbleness, the patience of our God when you see it from that perspective? God allowed Satan to test him in front of the angels. And because God loved the sons of God so much and Job so much, he allowed Satan to attack Job in order to expose Satan as a liar so that the angels would never doubt God's judgment and assessment and also vindicate Job in the sight of the angels that what I said about Job was right. Don't you ever believe this wicked, lying deceiver. You with me there? Did you catch it? You understand now what the story of Job is all about? God coming to the vindication of Job and protecting his, his heavenly host from being deceived with doubts by the deceiver like he made Adam and Eve deceive God's integrity. Don't tell me it can't happen. It happened. Adam and Eve started questioning the goodness of God, whether God was being up, up front and forthright with them. You with me there? Do you catch it? So to answer a question, one of the reasons why evil happens, Zena, is because God is allowing that trial to vindicate you, to exalt you in the sight of heaven, and protect you from the accusations of Satan. And in so doing, when you endure by the power of the Holy Spirit to the end, he will then reward you with the crown of life. You with me? I'm, I'm, before I move on, I want you to catch it. Now, here's where it gets even more beautiful. At the end of the story, when Job wants an answer, notice again the humbleness of God. It actually moves me in my heart. <clears throat> notice again the humbleness of God. He never says to Job, Job, you know why I did what I did? Why, God? Because I was going to bat for you. I praised you in heaven. I told the inhabitants of heaven, you're the most righteous man on earth. Satan accused me of having the wrong assessment of you and questioned your integrity. So I allowed him to do this to vindicate you in the sight of heaven, showing that my view of you is right. I did it for you, even though you didn't understand it. But you know, God never justifies himself. He doesn't explain it to Job. He simply says, Job, when you can answer these questions, then you have a right to question my judgment. In other words, what you're supposed to learn from this, folks, God will not always tell you the reason why you're suffering because he just wants you to trust him. Trust me. I don't need to vindicate myself to you, Sam. You know me. You've been walking with me. You may not understand, Sam, why you're going through this. Why you've lost your children for a season and you haven't seen them in months. Why you have a corrupt judge trying to destroy you financially and leave you penniless. And why you had a woman destroy your family because of adultery. You don't understand why I allowed this. And you may never get an answer on this side of eternity. But Sam, you've been walking with me. The last thing you need to do is question me. Because you know how much I love you. You know how much I love you. When I say to Jesus, Lord, I love you. <clears throat> you don't need to prove yourself to me, Lord. You don't need to prove yourself to me. You don't need to vindicate me in heaven. Lord, I'm not worthy. And even in hell, even in hell, I will love you and praise you. You don't need to do for me what you did for Job. Because I'm no Job. <clears throat> right? You with me there? So what God was telling Job, I have my reasons. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. 
you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't see what I see. Job, trust me. It was for your own good. Trust me. I did it because I love you. <clears throat> I did it because I love the angels. I did it to protect them from doubting me because of Satan's lie. And I did it to vindicate you in the sight of heaven. In the sight of heaven, Job. Right? But he didn't tell him the reason. He simply said, when you can answer these questions, Job, then you have a right to demand of me to justify myself. So what you're supposed to learn from the book of Job, God may not tell you the reason why you're suffering or you've lost a loved one or you're sick. But God wants you to know he loves you. He fights for you. He'll protect you. And no power in all creation will ever separate you from his love, the love of the Father, the love of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. And that should be sufficient. You with me there? In other words, let's not do what Job did. You have to explain to me why this is happening. I've loved you all the days of my life. I served you. I put you ahead of everything. Why are you doing this to me? And another thing you need to learn, Beware of foolish men and women who think they have the wisdom of God and are speaking foolishly and stupidly with ungodly counsel to make you doubt what's happening. Make sure you don't have the friends of Job. Are you with me? Is it making sense? It's not he showed self-righteous, Shelley Moore. No, no, no. Let me correct that. See, here again, you're not understanding Job's heart. Job's heart, that's why God understood Job's pain. Job loved God so much, he couldn't understand why God had turned against him and became his enemy. God, I loved you more than anything. God, you were my best friend. Why are you so angry with me? Why would you hate me? Why would you do this to me? What have I done to make you hate me and abandon me and turn your back on me? Job wasn't doing it out of self-righteousness. He was doing it out of pain for thinking that the one I love the most has now become my enemy. Why? What did I do to make you hate me? What did I do to make you turn your back on me? What did I do to make you abandon me, God? Don't you know that I love you more than anything? Why would you treat me worse than an enemy? That's why he was angry. Why would you do this to me? How could you treat me worse than an enemy? What have I done to make you abandon me? Right? But he didn't understand. Here's what's beautiful. Job chapter 1 and 2 gives us the answer to why Job went through it. But Job never received the answer. Because... The reason why I repent is because of him questioning God's faithfulness and goodness and love for Job. Because he thought that God had become his enemy and had abandoned him. And that's when he realized, no, Job, no, you're wrong. <clears throat> I will never leave nor forsake you, Job. <clears throat> Sorry. Job, you're wrong for thinking I've become your enemy. Job, you're wrong for thinking I turn my back on you. You should know better. You should know better. Job, I can never leave nor forsake you. I can never hate you. I can never abandon you. And even you see the heart of Job in the following passages. Here's the heart of Job in the following passages. Job 13, 15. Job 13, 15. Right? Job chapter 13, verse 15. Let's see his heart. His heart crying out. Right? Watch here. Job 13, verse 15. Watch here. Look at his heart. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Did you catch it? God, I love you so much that even when you slay me, I won't stop trusting in you. Do you see it? 
And notice his heart's desire in Job 19, 25 to 27. Job 19, 25 to 27. Douglas, that's what's ironic. God never told him that. If you read Job 38 all the way to 42, he never told him that he was vindicating him. You're told that in the beginning of the book. Job 19, 25 to 27. Amen. Job 19, 25, 27. Notice his heart here, folks. Notice his heart. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. I know my God will come to the earth. He will stand on the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. Mine own eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. You see, he had the hope of the resurrection. He knew that one day Jesus, his God, would come to the earth. And when God, who is Jesus, comes to the earth, he would be raised in that flesh, and in my flesh I will behold him. There you are. I've been dying to see you. My heart, all these years, ached to see you with my eyes. And here you are, finally, on the earth. And in my flesh, I behold you, my Redeemer, my God, my love, my life. You see his heart? You know what's beautiful? <clears throat> you know what's beautiful? He didn't have to wait till death and the resurrection to see him. Because God showed up to him in Job 38. Job, you don't have to wait till the end. I'm here now. I'm here now. Son, I'm here. And yes, your Redeemer lives. And I am here. I am here. And I've not come to make you feel embarrassed, to shame you, to humiliate you. I'll rebuke you not to shame you, but to remind you. Don't you dare doubt my love for you, Job. In fact, I love you so much that I now appeared in person, visibly in the whirlwind, in person, to speak to you face to face. Will you ever doubt my love again? Will you ever doubt my love again? Now, Zena, do you see why, at least one of the reasons why God allows Satan to wreak havoc and evil? One of the reasons given in scripture, one of the reasons, there are other reasons. But do you see it now? The evil that's taking place in your life, you don't know why. God knows. And he's allowing it because he's doing something for you, for your sake, on your behalf, because he loves you. And the Lord is just telling you, Zena, Zena, you don't understand why. But daughter, please trust me. Trust me. I love you more than you can imagine. Please trust me. Don't let Satan tempt you to doubt me. Like he tried to do with the host of heaven. And he tried to do with my servant Job. Trust me. I adore you. And Zina, the proof that I adore you. I became flesh. Lived on this earth for over 30 years. And I allowed wicked, evil, despicable, sinful men to lay their dirty hands on me, to beat me to a bloody pulp, to whip me to the point of death, to drive spikes in my hands and my feet, nailing me to a cross, hanging naked, gasping for breath. And I did this, Zena, not only to show you that I love you, but to share in your pain. I entered the world to experience your pain, to identify with you so you can never say to me, God, you don't know what it's like to be abandoned by your friends. Zena, my best friends betrayed me. God, you don't know what it's like for a parent to lose a child. Zena, my own mother, the woman that I love, Saw me naked on a cross. Saw her firstborn beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, 
hanging on a cross, gasping for air. My beautiful mother saw her baby Our baby died before our eyes. <clears throat> and you're telling me, you're telling me I don't know? I don't know what it's like to be abandoned by my friends. <clears throat> I don't know what it's like to be betrayed. I don't like I don't know what it's like to have family members ashamed of me, embarrassed by me. Mark 3 20 to 21. And Mark 3 31 35 it says Jesus' family came to take him home because they thought he was out of his mind. They thought he was crazy. John 7, verses 1 of 5, it says his brothers didn't believe in him and wanted him to go public to be exposed so he could be killed. In other words, what he's saying to every one of us, I understand your pain more than you realize because I entered your world to become one of you, to experience your pain personally. So I know what it's like for a mother to be heartbroken and crying over the death of a child. I know what it's like for a father to bury a child. I know what it's like to be hated by your family, your family embarrassed and ashamed of you. I know what it's like to be betrayed by your best friends and abandoned and left alone. I know because it happened to me. It didn't have to. I didn't have to do it. I did it to show you. Never doubt me. Never, never, never question my love for you. I love you more than you can imagine. I love you more than you realize. I ache for you. That's what Jesus is saying. You know, grown men, gentle men, especially are not supposed to be crying. But that's what you learn from the book of Job, right? May the Lord sanctify my heart, purify it for his glory. Please, my God. <clears throat> right? So you learn from Job. A lot about Satan, how he works, and why God did what he did, right? You learned it, right? Why God did what he did. Okay. Satan wanted the angels to doubt God's judgment and wanted Job to curse God. God, knowing his motives, allowed it. He allowed it. Why? To show the angels he's a liar. Don't ever, ever trust him. When I say something, have no doubt, I cannot lie, I speak the truth. And what I said about Job is right. And Job, I was defending your honor in heaven. Now, you understand? You understand the honor that God gave Job? God in front of heaven, in front of heaven said, That man, there's none like him in all the earth. You understand? God praises you in front of the heavenly host. Like he said about Job, if you are walking in the spirit, God is saying, Jesus is saying, Michael, Gabriel, look at that young woman there. See that woman? She lost her son, and yet she loves me. She lost her family, 
but she can't live without me. She lost everything, but she loves me more day and day. That is my child purchased by my blood. Do you know that? Let me give you a passage for that. Matthew 10, 32 to 33. Matthew 10, 32 to 33. Right. Exactly. No, no one's going to understand it, right? Amen. Notice what our Lord says here, Matthew 10, 32, 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, you confess me before men, will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Did you catch it? You acknowledge me on earth, I acknowledge you in heaven. You deny me on earth, I will deny you in heaven. Mark 8, 38. I don't know what blow up means, brother. I hope it's a good thing. Mark 8, 38. Mark 8, 38. Almost done, folks. And I'm going to bring in my series on the Archangel Michael not being Jesus. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Did you catch it? You're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you in front of the angels and, and my Father. Mark 8, 38, right? You confess me, I'll confess you. Revelation 3, 5. Revelation 3, verse 5. Nope, Mary never abandoned her son. Mary, the mother of our Lord, was there at the cross, John 19, 25, 27. And I'm going to comment on that real quickly. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, watch here, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Hallelujah. Did you read that? Do you see what Jesus said? If you endure till the end and you don't deny me, I will confess you before my father, before the angels. You deny me, I'll deny you. You know what that means? Guys, Jesus cannot lie. Jesus is alive. He's real. And the Bible is his word. You know what that means? I promise you this is going to happen because Jesus said it. The day will come where he's going to say, Father, Michael, Gabriel, here is first and the last. Father. This man here was not ashamed of me. Michael, first and the last, went to jail for me. First and the last, lost his job for me. First and the last, praised me on earth. And I am proud to say he's my brother. And you know what you're going to hear? Michael's going to say to you, he who honors my Lord, honors me. Gabriel's going to say, because you made my Lord happy, you make me happy. And I'm honored to be in your presence, first and the last. I'm honored to be in your presence, Protestant believer. I am honored to be in your presence, Zena and Ruhul. I, Gabriel, the angel, am honored to be in the presence of those who've made my Lord my Savior, my Creator, my God, my life, Jesus, the Father's heart, happy. When you make him happy, you make me happy. We are honored to have you here. Come. <clears throat> That's the promise of Jesus, right? That's the promise of Jesus, isn't it? Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.12. And we're going to talk real briefly about John 19, 25, 27. And then tomorrow, Lord willing, I'll do a session on the Archangel Michael not being Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.12. He is infinitely beautiful. He is beauty. Watch here. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also he also will deny us. Did you catch it? Deny him, he denies you. Confess him, he confesses you. You confess him on earth, he confesses you before the Father and before the angels. Right? You catch it? It's a promise. By the holy blood of Jesus covering us, by the Spirit filling us, 
by the Spirit filling us. Holy Spirit, you, we love you. We're in love with you. You, by your power, we will never, because you will not allow it, Holy Spirit, we will never deny Jesus. Right? Let's end it here, John 19, 25, 27. Zena, did you get part of the answer why God allows these natural disasters? Part of the answer, not all of it? Yes, you can, Sam Price, but we'll go into it more in depth in the upcoming sessions. Right? Okay. John 19, 25, 27. Watch here. Talk about the heart of Jesus. Watch here. Watch here, guys. Thank you, Ethel. <clears throat> you just pray Jesus protects me, huh? John 19, 25, 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. I hope I don't get choked up again. And his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. Now watch here. His mother is there. His mother is there. Folks, understand. Well, let me read it. I'm going to unpack it. When Jesus therefore, therefore saw his mother, the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her up unto his own home. Guys, let me explain this. Let me take a moment to explain this because I want you to really, really love those whom Jesus loves. I want you to love Paul because Jesus loves Paul. I want you to love John because Jesus loves John. I want you to love the blessed mother of Jesus because Jesus loves her. If you believe the Bible, Jesus not only existed before Mary, he created her sustained her, gave her life, and he chose her to be his mother, right? Because he's the creator, right? Exactly, Douglas. You're taking the words out of my mouth. Now, you understand what that means? Not only did Jesus give Mary the greatest honor any woman could have to give birth to God in the flesh as a virgin, he also knew by choosing her, he would have to break her heart. Let me understand. Let me explain what it means. Jesus knew... Now, folks, understand, this is his mother whom he loves and adores. Even he didn't spare her from heartbreak. Understand, listen, let it sink in. Jesus knew that young woman, I have created her to be my mother. That young woman is going to give birth to me in the flesh. And that young woman, I will not be able to spare her from being heartbroken and from seeing me beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, gasping for her on the cross and dying before our, her, her eyes, I have to allow her to be heartbroken, crushed in her heart because of what's going to happen to me, her son. Jesus did not even spare his own mother from being crushed at the heart from seeing her son beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, hanging on a cross. You're going to make me cry too, Douglas. And expiring before her eyes. Mother, I love you. I adore you. But I can't spare you from this pain. It has to be this way in order for to me to save the world and save you. I know you don't understand at this moment right now what's happening. But mother, I promise you, when I rise from the dead and I appear to you, it will be all good then. And your heart won't hurt anymore because you'll see me again. <sighs> And you know what he's saying to you, you guys? Okay. Here's what he's saying to all of you. I know you're heartbroken because you lost your father, your mother, your spouse, your sister, your brother, your child. I know your heart is crushed. But I promise you, if you believe in me, if you trust in me and you know that I live, you will see them again. And I promise you, when you see them again, death will never, ever 
separate you ever again. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. And I promise you, it will have been worth it. Trust in me. Believe in me. Love me. Cleave to me. Because I will never leave nor forsake you. So, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Lord, please wash us in your blood and forgive us. And please sanctify my heart to do it from a pure motive. Not to do it for the praise of men, but for your glory, Lord Jesus. And please use this session to touch hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, we love you by the power of your Holy Spirit. And please fill us. And Lord, please fill my daughters. Please fill them and their mother and convict her. Bless them. Restore them, Lord Jesus, and heal our hearts. And Lord, please sustain me to glorify you and provide for our needs. And it's worth it, Lord. I say this, Lord. You will never have to vindicate yourself to me. Never. You will never have to justify yourself to me. Lord, never. You will never have to explain to me the things that happen. I deserve hell. And you deserve all glory. And Lord, I pray this from my heart, that it's from your spirit. And I pray on behalf of everyone. Lord Jesus... We love you. We're in love with you. We can't live without you, Lord. Please save us. Save us. Master, save us. We love you, Son of God. We love you. In Jesus' name. Lord willing, tomorrow, God willing, we'll start my series on Jesus not being the Archangel Michael. Now, keep praying for me and pray for my child. The Lord will get me out so I can do this work for his glory. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow around 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Pray God will use me here mightily and pray that my work is not in vain, that the Spirit will seal me and perfect me and take me to higher levels for the glory of Jesus. All right? Thank you, guys. Christ is risen, and he loves you more than you can imagine.